My guest today is Max McLean, a very talented actor, producer, writer. We met uh, at the prayer breakfast in Washington, D.C. We both made uh, speeches about God to journalists, uh, which actually caused the journalists to burst into flame. It was a, a very dramatic event. Uh, Max uh, runs the Fellowship for Performing Arts in New York City, which does a Christian material, and he's done a lot of work on C.S. Lewis. I saw his wonderful uh, version of uh, the Screw Tape Letters on stage, and now I've watched a movie he's made of a stage performance about C.S. Lewis's conversion experience. It's called C.S. Lewis, The Most Reluctant Convert. We have just a little bit of it uh, right here of the trailer. I never cared for my name, Clive Staples. The world came to know me as C.S. Lewis. Perhaps you've read my books. The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe is the most famous, but there's one story that's not so well known. It's my story. And who better to tell it than me? Cheers. Catch up! Hey, Jack, no, stop! Don't disturb your father! Oh. Boys! Your mother loves you very much. <laughs> At 14, I ceased to be a Christian. She was the first woman to speak to my blood. I love the smell of bunting. And I was undone. <laughs> That's great stuff. Max, thank you for coming on. Uh, the, the, the movie is terrific. It's really moving. It's really involving. Uh, you sent me a, a preview code and I got to watch the whole thing. I was, I was really taken with the way you slipped into this part of C.S. Lewis as if you lived there. Uh, you actually show us on screen. You're kind of slipping into the, into the part. Do you feel some special connection with this guy? I mean, is there something personal here between you and him? Yeah, well, I've been uh, playing his work or uh, dealing with his material, his language, the way he uh, articulates uh, for a long time. First with screw tape, uh, then we did a stage adaptation of The Great Divorce. And as a result of those two pieces, I wanted to take a look because they, they both hint at his own conversion. And uh, so that prompted me to go to his memoirs, uh, Surprised by Joy. And uh, uh, what I did to try to understand how Lewis thinks, I actually transcribed the book to follow his thoughts after him. You know, why did he go this way as opposed to that way in a particular thought? And uh, that really uh, got me inside uh, his, uh, his huge personality, his, his de self-deprecating sense of humor, uh, his uh, his intense uh, 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 rationality, you know, he just digs really deep there and and uh, and follows it as far as he can go. So I, I would say that uh, I know him pretty well. Is there a connection? I, I don't want to get too personal, but is there a connection mm -hmm. between? Are you a, a cradle Christian, or did you also have? A no, journey? I'm an adult convert as well. Uh, and uh, and and I was first given his book. Uh, surprised by joy his memoir right after my conversion and i i read every word of it but i don't rem i was in my 20s uh but i don't remember like tracking with it i thought he was way over my head and so the person said well then try this one it was screw tape letters and i said oh i get this one i got i know this guy really really well uh but uh no i i i really tracked with i think he's become a spiritual guide to me because uh, you know, I had a lot of skepticism going in, and and uh, Lewis helps work through that. Yeah, it, I mean, his, his intellectual journey is so fascinating. It's really hard to tell an intellectual story. You do it with great humanity, and it was really, I was deeply moved throughout the movie, but it really is a story of a guy's mind uh, embracing a truth he doesn't want to face. And uh, and that's, a, you know, that is a powerful tale, but it's hard to catch it on film, and you do. I, I, I couldn't help wondering, you're in New York City, the, the heart of darkness. Uh, you've, you're running <laughs> this Christian uh, theater. Is the, is that hard to do? I mean, is that is is that a difficult? Is it difficult to bring this kind of material to the theater? Uh, well, if you're the producer, then you know you put up all the resources. So uh, you know we we pay our bills just like everyone else. 
uh, and that makes it a little bit easier. However, if I was trying to convince somebody to produce it for me, I think it would be impossible. Mm -hmm. uh, we do get a, a, a pretty, you know, we've gotten really good press in New York. Uh, we're probably the only ones doing this with any regularity. Um, and what we try to do is produce in New York, and then we, uh, we export it around the country. We do tours around the country. Uh, the key thing with our work is is we want to we want to find uh, our mission is produce theater from a Christian worldview meant to engage a diverse audience. That's pretty hard to do. Uh, so we we gotta we gotta stick with kind of material that we feel would appeal to uh, uh, to someone who's uh, who's open certainly skeptical but but open minded enough to to listen. Uh, it, it, the language has to be good. We have to articulate it at the highest levels that our budgets will allow. So that we can play the the the, the venues we want to play here in New York and around the country, uh, and then thankfully we uh, we ask people to support us and people do, uh, and so I, I think that that the key uh, to our work is picking the right material, executing at the highest levels that we can. You know, you hit in this story. It's a, the film is called the the most reluctant convert, the untold story mm -hmm. of C.S. Lewis, and you hit you you. It's very condensed. You hit certain high points or, or low points, depending on your point of view. Mm -hmm. And one of, one of the points that you saw in the trailer uh, is the death of Lewis's mother. I mean, this is a mm -hmm. devastating, a devastating event in any child's life. But it basically puts him at odds with the idea of Christianity. He says they stopped being a Christian. And, and yeah. he, he had a lot of integrity about that, didn't he? I mean, he kind of stuck to that. Yeah, well, uh, he, you know, he was raised in a... Uh, in at least a, a, a nominally Christian home, he said that uh, uh, you know he was uh, uh, he was taken to church. He did couldn't find he didn't find much interest in it. Uh, but uh, when his mother uh, was came down with cancer when he was nine, he prayed, and he expected God to answer his prayer. He didn't come, uh, but he came to the conclusion God didn't work. Uh, or a prayer didn't, doesn't work, and so he he left that, and and that was the first step towards uh, moving beyond uh, the sort of traditional uh, approach to Christianity in in his home. Uh, you know, he said that uh, there the way that Christianity was taught in school that there were a thousand false religions, but uh, the thousand, the thousand and first was completely true, <laughs> meaning his own. And he said, on what grounds? And he, he said, if, if if Adonis can be explained away, then why not Christ? So then he, you know, he slow, little by little, he became an apostate. He said, uh, and he disregarded his faith or uh, with uh, no sense of loss and with a great sense of relief. Uh, and that was uh, that was where he was uh, early on. Uh, he had a bad relation with his dad. Uh, he had uh, he saw the butchery of World War One, uh, and he came to the conclusion after that that either there's no God behind the universe, a God indifferent to good and evil, or or worse, <clears throat> excuse me, or worse, an evil God. And it's from that low point that the journey heads upward, and uh, and and most of it was was rational, but with Lewis, rational was tied to his emotions very, very closely. Mm. If something was true, he believed it, and, and he went with it as far as he could. And probably the uh, the, the, the biggest issue was was a rationality, you know, is uh, someone asked him if, if, if uh, logic and reason brings forth indisputable truth, he says he thinks it does, and is asked if his uh, moral and aesthetic values were, were, were meaningful, he said it, it was, and and so the person said, well, then uh, his materialism had to be abandoned because uh, materialism is all atoms colliding in skulls. It's all physics and biochemistry. There's nothing beyond that. And Lewis came to the conclusion that uh, that life at its uh, uh, ultimate reality had to be at some level intelligent. And uh, that was the first step. You know, you mentioned World War One. I'm, I'm, I've always been fascinated with World War One. It seems to me that it's the complete death of the greatest culture that has existed on Earth so far. Uh, just the complete collapse for no apparent reason, except that it's it's time. 
Right this minute, I'm, I'm reading a book I'm shocked to find I'd never read before, uh, Testament of Youth by Vera Britton, which is a classic memoir uh, of World War I. And one of the things that happens is with so much destruction, so much loss, so much grief, she loses her faith. She comes out of, of it basically an unbeliever. C.S. Lewis was in World War I. People forget this, as you say, and, and he was badly wounded. And the description of it in the film uh, is kind of remarkable. Can you kind of convey some of that? Because it really took me aback uh, what happened. Well, he, uh, yeah, it's, uh, I mean, he, he was wounded. And uh, he, he, the first thing he said, uh, as soon as I was hit, he said, uh, I thought this was death. He felt no fear, no courage, just the thought, here lies a man dying. Mm -hmm. Then he makes this extraordinary parenthetical phrase, it wasn't even interesting. <laughs> uh, but uh, but it was, uh, you know, he, he did talk about it was, uh, it was an abandonment of rationality. He just, it was it, it, the, the sheer imbecility of it. There was nothing, you know, there, there was nothing redeeming about it. And then when he, uh, and when he got home, everybody just tried to forget about it. Yeah. You know, it's over. And, uh, and he did too. And, uh, but ultimately he, he never could. He, he suffered from, from terrible dreams most of his, uh, his life. And he, uh, he actually, uh, has some shrapnel in his body to the day of his death. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very impressive that you forget because he's such an intellectual, uh, you know, such an elevated thinker and an elevated writer. You forget that he was in this absolute cataclysm, blood drenched cataclysm, lost a friend uh, in it and saw the worst that human beings can do. You then you show again, it's really concise the way you did this. I was really <laughs> impressed with the way you got very, very complicated ideas into a very short amount of space. But he became part of this group, the Inklings, uh, where he was friends with the, uh, Tolkien, who was uh, obviously another great fantasy writer, and this guy, Owen Barfield, who's probably the least well-known of the Inklings. He is one of my favorites. Uh, he's a brilliant, brilliant man, a terrible writer. You have to read every sentence he wrote three times to even get any kind of sense out of it. Once you get the sense, it's really brilliant. This relationship that they had were they was that was that all the Inklings were there three of them or were there more? No, there were there were uh, several more. His brother was involved. A fellow by the name of Dyson was involved, and many people. Charles Williams was involved. It was a, a pretty impressive group, and and what they essentially did was uh, 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 review each other's writings, hmm. and out of that, you know, came probably the two the greatest uh, fantasy writers of the 20th century and, and Lewis and, and Tolkien. But it was definitely an iron sharpening iron group. Uh, and uh, we owe a lot to them. What, what was it that, that Tolkien said to Lewis that so affected him? You have this, I, I took this walk when I was in, uh, visiting my son in Oxford and there's this road that they walked along and they had Madison's this famous walk. conversation. What, what is that conversation? Well, you know, Lewis, uh, Lewis had two very powerful conversion experiences. One was to God, to theism, to, as he describes, is, a, uh, is the God of the Jews. Or he says, my training was like that of the Jews, because he realized that he was, uh, he admitted that God was God, knelt and prayed. And he said his religion was like that of the Jews. But he had no understanding. He had, uh, he had no idea what the incarnation was. The God to whom he surrendered was not human. He made a big point of that, not human. Uh, but he, you know, he came to the conclusion that uh, if I have some, if I have a, 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 you know, his his argument against God was that the universe was so cruel and unjust. And well, how did I get this notion of cruel and unjust? He says, if I call a line crooked, it's because I have some idea of a straight line. What was I comparing the universe with when I called it cruel and unjust? And that that notion led him to the ultimate moral lawgiver, uh, God, but he couldn't come to terms with Jesus. He said, you know, he told uh, Tolkien in this famous walk, Addison's walk, a uh, couple of years after his conversion to, to God, that, uh, you know, I, uh, under, uh, under great resistance and reluctance, I've come to believe in God, but, but not Jesus. I can't understand how the the life and death of someone else, whoever he was 2,000 years ago, could help us here and now. And, and Tolkien did something really interesting. He, 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 he captured Lewis's 
interest in fantasy, interest in myth. And he said to Lewis that when you meet a god sacrificing himself in a pagan story, dying god myths like Baldur, Osiris, Dionysius, all those dying god myths, he says you like it very much. And you're mysteriously moved by it, provided you meet it anywhere except in the Gospels. <laughs> and so he says, and then he says this, he says, the story of Christ is a myth working on us. And I love this idea, working on us in the same way as other myths with one tremendous difference. It really happened. Yeah. And something happened uh, mysterious at that moment. There was a rush of wind that Lewis captures in his memoirs. But what that did, it made Lewis begin to read the gospel differently. He started reading it like a hero story, uh, like a myth, because here was the, the true myth in which all other myths point. And so that got him to the conclusion, what do I do with this person in Jesus? And of course, he came up with his uh, very famous trilemma, either this man was, uh, was a liar a uh, lunatic on the level of someone who claims to be a poached egg because he claims to be God, or else he is who he said he was. And uh, and, and he said there's really no uh, other real alternative uh, if you take the gospel story seriously. So that was uh, that was the 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 key moment, which uh, which of course he said later. I know uh, very well when, but hardly how. I made the final step, which is when I was on the motorcycle ride to Whipsnade Zoo. He says, when when we set out, I did not believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. When we reached the zoo, I did. <laughs> <laughs> Talking to Max McLean, the actor and uh, writer of The Most Reluctant Convert, The Untold Story of C.S. Lewis. I want to make sure I get this in. How do, how do people see this? I, I, yeah. You gave me a code, but how do they get to see it? Well, it's, uh, there's a website, cslewismovie.com, cslewismovie.com. They can see a trailer. Well, I, really, again, Max, it's a great performance. It's a genuinely terrific performance and a very, very uh, simple performance, as great performances always are, uh, and just a very moving story well told. The Most Reluctant Convert, The Untold Story of C.S. Lewis. Max McLean, it's good to see you. If you're ever uh, around town, let me know, and uh, we'll get together. Love to see you again, Andrew. Thanks Delighted. a lot. Remember Thank you so much. Bye-bye.